And we are ready to start now. Professor Boatka, please, the floor is yours. Thank you so very much, Daria, for this kind introduction and for the invitation. Um, thank you for um, organizing this um, to Eurostory and um, to the University of Helsinki. It's um, really a pleasure to be here in this virtual space with you today. I wish it weren't virtual, but um, I'm grateful it's possible as it is. I've already learned a lot from the past two days of, of talks. So um, I'm gonna try to weave my own perspective into this uh, and use a um, understanding of minority that uh, is not necessarily demographic, uh, but one that has to do with my own um, research on um, European discourse and uh, European narratives, because I thought your combination in the conference title of minority experiences and European narratives uh, speaks to um, very many aspects. So I'm going to uh, try and also guide you a little bit through how I come to my perspective and what that possibly has to do with the um, framing of the conference topic as you presented to us so far. I'm going to share the screen as we're accustomed to. Can you see it? Okay. So um, in the context of dealing with the idea of minority and um, European narratives, um, it might be surprising that the first um, thing that came to my mind, at least, was this um, movie Minority Report that I'm sure most of you know, 2002 Hollywood thriller starring Tom Cruise. Um, when I actually want to talk about minority perceptions and differential visibility in public discourse, public space, and policy. So um, the interesting thing that I thought um, the movie can offer is an entry point into understandings of um, predictability and visibility. As you might remember, um, the movie is set in the year 2054. So some 30 years from now. Um, and it's aimed at alerting us to a proximate future in which crimes would be reliably predicted by prescient humans um, with increased cognitive capacity. So they're called precox in the movie. So what does this Hollywood script have to do with minority or minorness, if at all? Interestingly, in the movie, the reliability of the prediction um, was only warranted when the police unit created for this specific purpose systematically disregarded the minority report among the precogs, the one that um, told a different story about the context, the causes, and the outcome of the series of events under investigation than the majority report did. Now, I'm not a film study scholar, and I'm also not particularly interested in giving this movie more credit in dealing with the issue at hand that it deserves, because it's certainly not a movie about minorities. And it's also not a movie interested very much in diversity. Um, it's more about special effects and spectacular um, kind of interpretations. But the interesting connection between the title and its main plot um, around the minority report has to do with the recurrence of eyesight, vision, and visibility as a central issue for drawing attention to the minor. And here I'm going to ask you to keep in mind the distinction between minority and the minor, if only as a question so far. So rather than minority, um, we would engage in uh, looking at minor ness. So um, from the movie poster, to um, all other type of promotional material, the fact that different ways of seeing, um, either through a device or through eyes, generates um, and reproduces inequalities is central to the movie's storyline. And I'll spare you here the more spectacular close-ups of eyeballs being scanned in the interest of state surveillance and crime prevention. You might remember them. But everyone probably does remember um, the character of Tom Cruise engaged in uh, mapping the images provided by the precogs into a coherent narrative. So the idea that you can arrange the events so as to have a coherent narrative about 
um, the crime in that um, case, but you can arrange events to form a storyline and to make sense of them is um, maybe the most um, attractive kind of feature of what the future holds, so to say. Um, and also there's a lot of um, kind of understanding of the um, visibility and blindness, kind of um, references to eyesight and, and vision, albeit most of them are for thrills. Um, the idea conveyed by um, things like in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king and Erasmus quote actually. Um, and for this understanding that um, it is a job, a policeman's job in that case to arrange um, events in a certain order for them to acquire visibility conveys the notion that visibility is a political decision, right? Uh, it is a conscious choice. And as such, it's one that it takes effort to counteract if it's biased, one-sided, or plain unjust. So in the following, um, I want to use the notion of the minority report rather than anything else related to the movie to draw attention to the systematic occlusion of minority experiences, those of people and regions racialized as non-European, non-white, and non-Western from narratives of Europe and European-ness. And I wanna argue that a focus on minor formations of today's Europe, um, in particular, its overseas countries and territories and outermost regions, this is an official designation, the long one, um, decisively unsettle our understanding um, of Europe, but also Europe's prevailing self-definition. So it's self-narrative, it's way it arranges events. A self-definition that very much has to do with being continental, white and Christian, um, and which very much enters um, EU discourse or, or really dominates EU discourse. So as a sociologist, um, I start from the subject position of most sociology, which is, um, we could say, not just modernity, but coherent Europe or as others have called it, Europe in theory. Now, Europe in theory um, is not only the title of um, a great book by Roberto Dainotto, published in 2012, um, whose cover really does a wonderful job of uh, conveying the importance of both Christianity and whiteness for a self-definition of Europe. The idea of coherent Europe is also part of a legacy of social theory, which has long operated with what I call a sanitized and sublimated version of European history. Now, what is sanitized in this context? Why do I say sanitized? To put it briefly, um, the Europe constituting the subject matter as well as the subject position of most sociological theory increasingly ignored the experience of the East, and the south of Europe in its accounts of Europe's trajectory towards modernity, nation state formation, and citizenship rights. This is why um, somebody like Roberto Dainotto wants to rethink Europe from the perspective of the south, um, or what has derogatorily been called um, the pigs countries in the context of the um, 2008 financial crisis. So the pigs countries being the southern Portugal, um, Italy, Greece, and Spain. Um, the prevailing version of European history also largely disregarded the West's colonial and imperial rule and their consequences. Now, this is not um, new for most of you here, um, especially because uh, we're all dealing with European narratives, um, especially uh, historians have addressed all of these kind of blind spots and have called attention to the partial um, character of the notion of Europe. In particular, uh, Bulgarian historian Maria Todorova has explained how Europe functions as an unmarked category. The only uh, one that doesn't need to be qualified is the one that um, actually references Western Europe. And as soon as you no longer mean Western Europe, you actually have to say it. So if, it, if you just say Europe, you certainly mean Germany and France. If you want to refer to um, any part outside of the West, you actually have to become specific, so to say. So the only unmarked category 
which signals a normative character. So the character of the norm is the one of kind of um, Europe unqualified or unmarked Europe. Um, in dealing with the other um, kind of character of Europe in this um, understanding of partiality that historians have discussed, um, most particularly and most um, famously maybe, uh, Dipesh Chakrabarty has pointed to how a hyper-real Europe becomes the theoretical um, subject of all histories, making it necessary to provincialize Europe in order to write adequate history. And of course, um, Larry Wolf, um, that has constructed or reconstructed the invention of other Europe's, in particular um, Eastern Europe, as a first other within. I'm not going to repeat their arguments here. Um, I really assume that they're familiar uh, to most of you. Instead, what I want to do is to um, search for a different entry point in paraphrasing Martinican writer Edouard Glissant, who first drew attention to the fact that the West is not in the West. It is a project, not a place. And as such, it is a political decision, just like arranging events in a certain sequence that has to do with one's self-understanding of what that project is. And I'm using this um, quote by Glisson in order to point or to suggest um, the fact that the same goes for Europe. So not just the West generally, but Europe also is a project rather than a place. And um, as such, it has been a long-term project. So it's a work in progress. Its current result um, consequently also represents a problem. So in order to contest the power um, that the power of definition of sanitized and ahistorical sociological categories, I suggest that it is imperative to complicate the notion of Europe by including its minority report. So Europe as a project, a process and problem, I once um, offered a class that was called that, and um, I was uh, trying to make sense of the literature about all of these dimensions, and there's a lot to point to that. So it's not my, um, I, it's only my synthesis, not my uh, specific contribution to it. Okay, um, now the project that has to do with speaking about Europe and reimagining, rethinking Europe um, through its minority report can be referred to um, by very different names. I have done work in which I refer to it as Europe otherwise, using basically an echo of the World Social Forum that suggests and points to the fact that another world is possible, but also post-colonial and decolonial um, understandings of how knowledges and worlds otherwise are possible as well. So the otherwise as the contested and the obliterated part of not only the discourse, but also the history and the reality. And um, the idea that I um, connect to the project of Europe otherwise is one that others um, have called the, the project of creolizing Europe that I also um, engage in as well, uh, which means to conceive of Europe as a creolized space by, and here um, this is my particular approach to it, by taking into account the regional entanglements derived from European colonialism and imperialism since um, the 16th century. Um, most particularly, there's a book by that very name, Creolizing Europe, Legacies and Transformation, uh, transformations edited by Encarnacion Gutierrez Rodriguez and Shirley Ann Tate, in which the focus is specifically um, on creolizing Europe through a look at its migration processes and the consequences of post-colonial and colonial uh, migrations for um, not having a coherent white Christian and um, homogeneous Europe today, but rather a creolized one. At the same time, um, my understanding of how we can creolize Europe 
um, through basically a theoretical reframing is to rethink it from what are its current colonial borders. And by that, um, I mean the overseas territories and countries that still belong to European states today, as well as the so-called outermost regions, which in itself is a very telling name, outermost, meaning that's so outer that it's actually not longer here. Um, and even as such, this is part of a project that has been um, referred again by other colleagues as creolizing theory, uh, especially by Françoise Lyonnais and Chou Meixu in the book by the same name, The Creolization of Theory, um, published uh, one year before um, the Creolizing Europe book, and um, basically defined um, in many um, ways by the authors of that book. And if for my own contribution to it, it is defined by reinscribing the experiences of people and regions racialized as non-European, non-Western and non-white into social theory, because I um, see sociology and especially uh, sociology that starts from the narrative um, center of a coherent Europe as having left out all of these experiences and all of these regions as not central. So when they're dealt with, they're dealt with in terms of um, experiences of the other that have nothing to do with Europe, that have no connection, whether historically or present, to Europe, and that are not constitutive of what we need to understand European society, European inequalities, racism, um, migration, or um, class structure, so to say. So, um, this idea of reinscribing experiences um, into social theory is, if we can make a bridge to the idea of minority, the kind of minority reports missing from an account of Europe that would make it, well, the opposite of coherent Europe, uh, basically the creolized um, version of it. And in a way, this has already been programmatically stressed by Lyonnais and Chu when they discussed what that means to have minor formations, whether geographically minor formations or epistemologically or um, politically minor formations, become theory. So this is what they call the becoming theory of the minor um, or thinking through and with invisibilized peripheral or subaltern formations, or what um, thinking with decolonial scholars such as uh, Quijano or Mignolo, we could call just thinking from coloniality, from the underside of modernity. Lyonnais and Chu define it as, um, or explain the project of creolizing theory and becoming theory of the minor by saying if minor formations become method and theory, then new analytics will be brought to the foreground to creolize the universalisms we live with today, doing so from the bottom up and from the inside out. It is this process of becoming theory of the minor that we are also calling creolization. Also, because there are many definitions of creolization, starting with um, kind of linguistic ones. Um, but here, the idea of asymmetry, power, and the colonial context is very central to um, the understanding of creolization. So, okay, what is actually the minor formation um, from which to think Europe otherwise? Because, like I said, one, one can start from migration as a neglected dimension, one can start from geographical minorness or from epistemic exclusions. And here I wanna um, give you a glimpse of how I came to the topic and what that has to do or what the current results of my research has to do with my own self-critique. For a long time, I was um, interested in the location assigned to Eastern Europe in the discourse about the European Union as a community of values and in how this type of discourse um, reflected the hierarchies between what I've called multiple and unequal Europes that resulted from the shifts in hegemony between different European colonial powers. And that had a lot to do with my biography. I uh, migrated from Romania to Germany some 25 years ago to study sociology. And this was in the context um, in which um, 
the Eastern enlargement was being negotiated and actually negotiated as the label of Eastern enlargement as such, because there have been other enlargement to the East that were not called Eastern enlargement, uh, such as Austria's uh, joining or, um, you know, um, Nordic countries were also not considered the Eastern enlargement, but um, then the East of Europe, the classical post-socialist um, East became the paradigmatic East that made the enlargement an Eastern one. So um, I was interested in how my own experience was not reflected in what I saw being negotiated in terms of Europeanness. I had been brought up to consider myself European um, growing up in Romania. That seemed to be increasingly questioned um, during my migration process in Germany and studying sociology I had, well, slowly, but uh, an apparatus to think about what that actually mean, uh, means. Um, and at the same time, I had been raised to consider myself white, or at least not having to think about whether or not I was white. And that was being increasingly questioned, not explicitly, but in very many subtle ways in which there were situations in which this was not an issue and situations in which it was clear that whiteness was at least questionable uh, when it came to Eastern Europeans. An issue that also had to do with citizenship, which in the context of Eastern enlargement increasingly started being um, kind of conflated with um, European Union citizenship. So a European citizenship no longer was a citizenship of a European country, but a European Union citizenship. And that did not apply to the part of the world that I came from until very um, late in my migration process, at least. So um, for a long time, this was, um, like I said, my, my entry point. I focused on how um, around the 18th century from that uh, point onward, France and England had uh, emerged as the self-proclaimed heroic Europe who had produced modernity's main revolutions. And at the same time, this uh, acted as a way to relegate the declining colonial powers, Spain and Portugal, to the status of what I called a decadent Europe. So discursively, right? Because the discourse was being produced from the standpoint of the self-proclaimed he um, heroic Europe. And in that same breath, or um, ba basically in the same geopolitical move, the European East was uh, relegated to a perpetual catching up with the West and um, defined into a kind of epigonal Europe, the kind of the epigon that always um, doesn't measure up. It's always lagging behind. And um, most useful for this, illustration of what I called uh, multiple and unequal Europes, I found to be the European Commission maps circulating around the year 2004 um, in order to explain to the public what the Eastern enlargement actually was. And um, some of these maps, and they're still around in, on the European Commission website, um, were very uh, didactically color-coded. Okay, in order to explain how the member states that were members in the year 2004 before um, the 10 European, uh, Eastern European countries joined were depicted in yellow. Then the 10 countries that were supposed to join in 2004 and that did join uh, were depicted in blue and purple were um, the ones that um, were denied access in the 2004 enlargement round, so Romania and Bulgaria, as well as Turkey, um, which had been a candidate to accession since 1986, but it was considered basically in the same, kind of the, in the next in line together with Romania and Bulgaria. And at the same time, um, when the um, enlargement happened and the um, 10 Euro Eastern European countries joined, of course, the European Commission produced another map to represent the new reality. And so the color coded was simpler this time. It was yellow or gray. Um, so all of the new member states were now just as yellow, so to say. Now there were shades of gray, pardon the pun here. Um, so the grayer, the lesser um, kind of chances to, um, to join at some point, so the, the lighter gray was um, 
out of discussion in terms of negotiations, um, Croatia had become a candidate at that uh, time. Romania and Bulgaria were still in some dark gray because they were um, going to join in 2007. Now, Turkey was, we don't know exactly what that particular shade of gray was supposed to mean, but it was uh, drifting further and further away from uh, the prospect of access. And what, um, I, so I did a lot of work with these maps. I used them um, in different ways in teaching, in writing, and I was fascinated by how I thought that they reflected what I had understood as this discourse of unequal Europe's really strikingly and sincerely just color coding the fact that there's a hierarchy within Europe and that this hierarchy is very much linked to uh, EU accession so that Europeanness really only gets distributed once you're a European Union member. Because around that time, the monopoly of the term Europe became um, a European Union kind of decision-making process. Europe the European Union was Europe. And that's how we started to um, even, not only the media discourse, but a lot of academic discourse conflating the two. So saying Europe, but meaning the European Union. And what was striking to me at some point um, was how for several years I had used um, these maps, but did not pay attention myself to the way the upper right corner depicted very much visibly and in yellow the colonial possessions of European um, states situated in um, the Atlantic Ocean, in South America, um, the Caribbean, and in the Indian Ocean in the case of uh, Réunion. Their belonging to Europe, their Europeanness, uh, and their status as European Union member states never being questioned in the discourse, but also not being addressed as the uh, paradigm of Europeanness, because of course, this is a un or inconvenient and unconventional uh, discourse if you refer to geographic or continental Europeanness um, as one criterion of accession, that would make these countries uh, or these territories obviously not uh, a good fit for such a definition. Um, as long as, especially in the case of Turkey, the discourse was, well, I mean, there are some human rights issues, but also Turkey is not really European because half of it is in Asia. Well, once um, you have parts of European countries situated in South America and the Caribbean, you can't really make that argument. So it's not convenient to point to the fact that these are European territories too. Although if we look at the uh, nation states, um, particularly the nation state discourse, especially in France, um, there's no question that these are um, national territories and you hear about them in the weather report, you hear about them in um, schools. So French atlases really tell French school children that Guyane is the poorest region of France. That's kind of a, um, the understanding of territoriality in that case. So what I wanted to point to in this kind of long trajectory of my own coming to the topic of Europe otherwise was how what I thought was a critical edge in addressing um, Europe and Europeanness by looking at the discourse from the European East turned out to be a complicity in invisibilizing other parts of Europe that I myself was actively forgetting, right? Because um, it's not that I forgot about them, they were right there. Actually, official European Union maps cannot be um, released without including these territories. These are official territories and any EU official will tell it, it's not new, we know, yeah, they're, they're there. But nobody really discusses them in terms of European Union accession, European mess or uh, European values uh, for that matter. So I became aware of how my focus on the East um, was not the critical edge and not enough of a critical perspective on how European Union discourse functioned um, because 
below what I thought was the lowest rung of the hierarchy of unequal Europe's, below the epigonal Europe, was still forgotten Europe. These territories not forgotten because I have forgotten about them, but because they are produced as absent in the discourse constantly by never making the um, object of a definition of Europeanness or criteria for uh, negotiating access. So um, I think we can refer to what I then called forgotten Europe as the minority report regularly missing from uh, Europe's self-representation and the checklist of modernity, which is still kind of pioneered or seen as spearheaded by um, the West of Europe. But at the same time, this minor is far from, or the minority report is far from minor in significance or consequence. And um, as such, it is, I want to suggest the result of the coloniality of memory that I define it as the systematic omission of enduring colonial ties from public discourse on Europe and the systematic avoidance of any overarching classification of current colonial territories as regions of Europe. Um, because the references that we do hear occasionally, the Dutch Caribbean, the British West Indies, the French Antilles, um, they're, they occasionally feature in public discourse. Um, they tend to be linked, however, to the imperial history of individual states. So they never point to the fact that these are European territories. They belong to the Netherlands, they belong to the UK, they belong to France, but they're not Europe. Um, so they are the problem to be solved by the um, individual countries. And that also reflects the fact that they have a uh, different status, right? I'm not gonna be able to go into a lot of detail about that. Um, the Dutch territories have a different status than the British ones the, anyway after Brexit and the French ones are the most integrated, but France also has different types of territories, both outermost regions and overseas territories and countries. And these have different administrative and juridical status. So um, there are lots of differences there. But um, as a whole, none of the references that we're accustomed to when we hear um, seldom enough anything about these um, territories, um, nothing involves their Europeanness or belonging to Europe. So um, what I want to point to in terms of how these territories are produced as absent in calling them part of forgotten Europe or forgotten Europe's is um, how they are distributed today. And again, here, Brexit is a, a turning point because um, a lot has shifted because of it. Um, but in terms of remaining colonial territories, I define forgotten Europe's as the um, territories divided between France and Great Britain, followed by Denmark, the Netherlands, Portugal, and Spain. So I refer to Europe as Europe, not as the European Union, not even um, so after Brexit. Um, and all of these territories um, are administratively part of the European states that colonize them and consequently of the European Union, either as integrated or as associated territories. That is one of the most uh, decisive differences between outermost regions and overseas countries and territories. Like I said, they're included in official maps of the European Union and their citizens in most cases have European Union nationalities. In the case of the British um, territories, it's um, the uh, British citizen overseas passport. So it is different, but it is it used to be a European Union nationality while uh, Britain was part of um, the EU. Now, the French overseas departments even use the euro as official currency and are represented on um, Euro banknotes. Um, so um, here, oops. Um, this is from the European Central Bank. Um, under the rubric of design elements is where the representation of France's and Spain and Portugal's overseas territories is uh, explained on the website. Uh, so not under the history of the Euro banknote or the history of Europe or anything, but under design elements. 
Um, so we learned that a geographical representation of Europe is shown on the back of both series of Euro banknotes that now include Malta and Cyprus um, after um, they weren't initially included. And the tiny boxes near the bottom of the banknote show the Canary Islands and some overseas territories of France where the Euro is also used. Um, no kind of um, expl explanation how that came about. And also we learned that very small islands are not shown because they cannot be accurately reproduced using high volume offset printing. So if you're absent from the map, it's because you're too small to count. But, and this is, this has a longer history where France actually insisted that its territories be represented on the banknotes, they initially weren't. Um, so the one territory that is easily recognizable because of its size is indeed French Guyana and it's the, the bigger, um, part shown there. Um, and um, here is a kind of blown up representation of those that have made it on the Euro banknote, the Azores, Madeira, uh, French Guyana, the French um, outermost regions, and the Canary Islands. Um, in that sense, um, it is important to see how the distribution of these territories, at least again before Brexit, used to be um, highly concentrated in the Caribbean so that if we thought about EU territories and if we now think about European territories, more than one third of them are located in um, the Caribbean, making this basically um, one of the most prominent or at least geographically um, recognizable uh, forgotten Europe's in one place, because otherwise uh, we have a lot of um, territories spread out across the world's oceans. Um, here's what basically the distribution of overseas countries, territories, and outermost regions looked like before Brexit, um, where the blue stars are the outermost regions, so they're integrated um, EU territories, and the yellow ones are overseas countries and territories, so they have associated status. But that would, if you look at the distribution, they're um, really not only across the world's oceans, but they are from north to south to west to east, um, basically all over the world. Um, now, Britain alone had 13 such territories, so with Brexit, um, this has changed um, in terms of the uh, distribution, but still. Um, with France and um, the Caribbean territories, there's um, kind of still a geographic widespread um, availability, so to say, of these territories. Now, looking at the Caribbean as the um, center of still encompassing so many of these dependent territories, not only um, with regards to the EU, like I said, but to Europe. Um, more generally, what I call Caribbean Europe, in order to have a reference to even discuss this reality, because we don't have a reference for them, except in terms of nation states, um, I see it as encompassing all the Caribbean territories previously colonized by a European power and presently administered as dependencies of a EU member um, or of the UK post-Brexit. Um, that includes the so-called outermost regions, Martinique, Guadeloupe, and French Guyana, and the French overseas community of Saint-Martin, and the overseas countries and territories, um, French Saint-Barthélemy, the British Virgin Islands, Anguilla, Bermuda, the Cayman Islands, Montserrat and Turks and Caicos, and the Dutch, Aruba, Curaçao, Saint-Martin, Bonaire, Saba, and saint Eustatius. And especially the Dutch territories have uh, very different statuses, especially also in the meantime. So the discussion um, can be differentiated there, but nevertheless, um, they are in many ways um, and administratively and legally um, European territories. What does this mean for the possibility of the minor becoming theory? I wanna, Coming to the end, um, look at three dimensions of how this is possible, how our thinking um, Europe through forgotten Europe's, especially through its Caribbean territories, but not only, changes our understanding of 
European borders, of European sovereignty, and gives us a very different perspective also on Brexit. And starting with borders uh, that we can think otherwise through the Minority Report, the first thing that taking Europe's colonial possessions um, seriously or into account when we do um, a kind of sociology of Europe is a drastic redrawing of EU borders. Basically, um, the EU Western border is relocated to French Guyana in South America and Guadeloupe in the Caribbean, um, but also a relocation of EU's external borders. France borders Brazil, um, not something we're accustomed to hearing and um, also not accustomed to being quizzed about um, what is the longest French border, what's so, um, long, it's the, the border between France and Brazil. Um, at the same time with the maritime border, the Netherlands border, um, Venezuela and the US through the um, Dutch territories in the Caribbean, um, or a relocation of EU's internal borders is something that um, happens alongside all of these other dimensions because um, territories in the Caribbean um, are differently arranged than on the European continent, um, obviously. So through the island of Saint-Martin, France borders the Netherlands, which it doesn't do on the continent. And the UK borders the Netherlands in the Caribbean, also through Saint-Martin. Uh, on the other side is the UK territory of Anguilla. And again, the um, Brexit has changed um, a lot of that. So if we try to look at what a global understanding of EU's borders would look like and a representation that does justice to this really colonial reality, um, then Europe's um, borders would change, but for the nor northern ones, right? Um, we have uh, La Réunion and Mayotte in the Indian Ocean. We have Guyane in South America, um, Saint-Martin, Guadeloupe, Martinique in um, the Caribbean, and the Azores and Madeira even moving um, west, Portugal's western uh, border. But the westernmost point, um, rather, is in the Caribbean. And these are just the outermost um, regions. The Overseas Countries and Territories Association in 2021, so after Brexit, looks like this. So still very much um, across the world, um, but not um, basically with the same kind of um, density as uh, they used to be with the UK being included in the, um, in the picture. What about sovereignty? Um, we're used in theory to um, see empires and nation states as mutually exclusive and chronologically discrete political formations, although um, historians have pointed to how these formations have coexisted in the past, but still the um, at least sociological, political science understanding of um, empires and nation states is one that is chronological. You end up, you end being an empire and that's when you become a nation state. Um, and, People like Freddie Cooper have criticized this very um, pointedly um, by saying um, if we explain away the existence of European empires such as the Habsburg, the Ottoman and the Tsarist Empire as survivals of the old order or anachronistic holdovers from an age of aristocracy, um, then we're not going to understand um, a lot of the very modern world. Um, and a lot of what that does is that uh, we tend to think of the current um, world as one dominated by nation states and of anything um, reminding of us of empire as remnants or as anomalies or as, as residues. But especially the literature on the Caribbean that um, deals with sovereignty, and that is a very rich one, as you can see, is um, dealing with a lot of terms to grapple with the reality that sovereignty in the context of 500 years and sometimes longer colonial rule cannot be understood in the same way. Um, there's the terminology of extended statehood by the Young Gun Krut, um, the uh, term post-colonial sovereignty gains by Avdan and Pramgad that 
point to the fact that dependent territories today have um, to negotiate different aspects of their sovereignty with the remaining colonial power, so that there are degrees of sovereignty, something also addressed by Lyndon Lewis when, when um, he looks at the myth of sovereignty in the Caribbean, but also um, the solution um, sought for uh, ongoing colonial uh, dependency, um, not only in the Caribbean, but especially, is um, something that can not just be um, independence from colonial rule after hundreds of years of occupation, uh, because then the options of becoming a nation state really have been criticized by a lot of Caribbean scholars as only signifying flag independence. You have a flag, you have a national day to celebrate, but you're economically, politically, epistemically, culturally, socially dependent on the structure that was put into place and that has flourished for hundreds of years. So that um, interviews in Guadeloupe that Yarimar Bonilla um, undertook for her book um, came up with the term uh, non-sovereign futures. Maybe the future has to be non-sovereign, not because it should involve an ongoing colonial relationship, but maybe it should involve responsibility from the colonial power and one that includes reparations, but not state independence as kind of um, taking off of um, colonial hands of one territory and saying, well, now you're on your own, that's what you wanted, right? Um, and coming to the last point, which is Brexit, um, the way to understand uh, Brexit differently would be um, by looking um, at, and this is one of my uh, favorite examples um, here, the territory of Angola, like I said, um, separated through its own English channel called the Anguilla Channel by France in the Caribbean or by the French um, island of Saint Martin and uh, dependent for infrastructure, medical supplies, and basically all um, existential goods on this EU border. Um, Anguilla being one of the uh, territories that has been um, or will be, because we don't know yet exactly, uh, most affected by Brexit. Um, but there's actually a very brief uh, three minute video that I want to show that explains this better and lets the people speak for themselves. So let me see if that can be heard. Well, the impact of Britain's departure from the EU is being felt as far away as the Caribbean. Residents of the British Overseas Territory of Anguilla had UK passports, but they weren't allowed to vote in the referendum. Yet their relationship with the European Union is fundamental to their everyday life. Anguilla is 4,000 miles from the UK in the Eastern Caribbean. It depends on the neighboring island of Saint Martin, first just 10 miles across the sea for vital services. The Saint Martin is half French and half Dutch. So will that strong relationship change after Brexit? Nisha Dupi lives in Anguilla and has been talking to some of the islanders. That's where a lot of my family live. They've migrated from Anguilla for maybe centuries. So that's why I'm concerned as to what will happen after Brexit. And we didn't vote. But that's the price we pay for being in an overseas territory. Do you feel British? <laughs> Am I British? Can I openly say that and feel comfortable that I'm a British person? Or are we just a, a little dot hanging with a name that is not really true to us? My name is Nisha Dupi and I live in Britain or part of it called Anguilla. Across the sea, 10 miles away is France or Saint Martin, a French and Dutch island. We are closer, more reliant on it even than Britain is to France. A large part of our transport, food and health services come from St. Martin. Last year, Anguilla was hit by Hurricane Irma, but the big storm this year is Brexit. Will we be cut off from the European neighbor we so depend on? <laughs> 
Angola and St. Martin is like brother and sister, or brother and brother. <laughs> you know, it's um, we depend on each other. Do you ever find yourself having to like go to St. Martin to use any of the services? Oh yes, all the time. You know, the health services, medicine. My wife, she depends on them very strongly. Uh, she has to take certain med medication every day of her life. So she has to go there for that. Do you feel that in light of all of this, Anglolians should have been consulted? At least we were true, would have been treated as uh, human beings, like people recognize that we are here, mm. you know, and, and that we, our lives value something. Yes, so basically the awareness of the population and governments um, about the situation um, is much um, clearer than in the case of the British government that actually did not include Anguilla uh, in negotiations at all. But the uh, Anguillan government did issue several reports pointing to um, the situation and also offering solutions in the form of bilateral agreements. Now, um, at the time that we're talking, Anguilla still faces um, the prospect of uh, really harboring a, an instant illegalized population of British people of color when the uh, restrictions take place. Right now, there's still um, COVID restrictions, so there's no um, access to the islands, and it is unclear, and also I wasn't able to um, get any official information about how it will go on. Um, people rely very much on informal understandings of, um, well, they will let us pass. We've always passed. Uh, they know us. Um, but once um, passport checks are enforced, this can become a real problem. I would like to close by going back to this um, map as one that, when used in teaching or in our representations of Europe more consistently, it would help creolize not only students' understandings of uh, where Europe's place in the world is, but also the place of responsibility in a global um, hierarchy very much put in place by European powers and very much not in the past, but um, still with us. And um, whether it is this map or um, another that points to the geographic dispersions of power being wielded to this day, every single second in one form of the other or the other that affects people directly, people's mobility, people's access to basic services, people, people's access to clean water, which is an issue in Anguilla as well, which gets its uh, bottled water from the Dutch part of the island, um, then it's not a geographic representation that is at stake here, but how the minor, um, the minor ness um, gets heard in the wider loud discourse of what Europe is about. Thank you.